Thanks. All right. I think we are all set. Sorry about that slight delay. All right. So we're going to get started. My son was in the 90th percentile of height and weight when he was born. And that wasn't so surprising. My husband happens to be over six feet. But by the time he hit his 12 year physical, he was actually down to the fifth percentile for height and weight. Now, if you have a 12 year old son or know a 12 year old boy, this was really, really stressful for him because all of his friends were hitting puberty and getting really big and tall and looking like young men. And he still looked like this little, little boy. So of course we talked to the doctor about it. The doctor thought it was probably just, he was late in puberty, but let's do some testing. So we went to NIH who did a battery of tests on my son, which was very, very scary um, to find out that he had celiac disease. Thankfully, nothing else. Now at that time I was a physical therapist and I was an avid cook and baker. I baked breads and cakes and pizzas and everything under the sun for my family. And now all of a sudden I had to learn how to do it all over again. <laughs> and as many of you know, it's a completely different chemistry. So we started down that road and I started trying different recipes and trying different flours. And I got a lot of cardboard. I got a lot of really hard, dense breads, all the horrible adjectives that you've seen and tried. I had them all. But in the end, I figured out how to make all of my family's favorite things gluten free. And in this process, I was also going gluten free and I found that I felt a whole lot better, but I still had some GI issues. So I actually did an elimination diet and found out that dairy was also a problem for me. And through that process, I also learned how detrimental to your health sugar could be. So being a glutton for punishment, I decided that I was gonna set out to learn how to cook and bake for my family in the healthiest way possible, which happened to be gluten-free, dairy-free, and refined sugar-free. The good thing that came out of this is I now have my business, cookcolorful.com. And through Cook Colorful, I have the opportunity every day to work with people to create chronic health through food and through delicious tasting food. So today in our presentation, I'm going to talk to you about healthier sweetener options and how it affects our body and also how we can use it to make delicious tasting desserts. And then after we talk about that, I'm gonna show you one of my family's favorite desserts, which is a chocolate olive oil cake with strawberry sauce. So the first question is, why is sugar so bad for you? And if I did a poll of the audience here, most people would say, well, it causes you to gain weight, or it leads to diabetes. And both of those would be absolutely true, but there are more reasons than just that. So sugar happens to be incredibly addictive. As a matter of fact, research has shown that it's more addictive than cocaine, which is hard to believe, but that's what they found. And the food industry and in trying to take advantage of that addiction has created all these foods that have a ton of sugar in it that's hidden. You wouldn't even know. So what a hundred years ago, the average American would have about eight pounds of sugar in a year. Today, we're having over 150 pounds of sugar in a year. And most of that 60% or so is from processed foods. So processed foods and sugar affect our microbiome in our gut, causing leaky gut, or at least we think that's research believes today that's what causes leaky gut. Um, leaky gut then leads to chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation has been tied to basically all of the cr major chronic diseases, including cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and autoimmune disease. 
So is there a difference between refined sugars and natural sugars? And the answer is yes. When we talk about refined sugars, we're talking about white table sugar and or brown sugar. Brown sugar is just white sugar that has a little bit of molasses mixed in. And it is refined very heavily, like 10 to 20 steps. When they do that, they use high heat. And that high heat removes any nutritive value that might have originally been in that, in that sugar. It usually it comes from either sugar cane or sugar beets. And unless you're buying organic, that sugar cane and sugar beet is grown with a lot of pesticides. It's generally genetically modified. So for so many reasons, it's not, sugar is really not great for us, the refined sugars. Then we have natural sugars and natural sugars have dietary fiber, which is good for us and slows down the metabolism. It has a lot of nutrients like fruits and honey and sweet and uh, maple syrup have a lot of nutrients still in them. And some of them even have some digestive enzymes that help us to metabolize them. So there are really some beneficial things to natural sugar. Having said that, even with the healthiest of sugar options or sweetener options, um, moderation is the key. So what we're trying to do when we're trying to create a healthy lifestyle and convert our recipes to be healthier is we're trying to find sweeteners that will have more uh, nutritional value and less refinement. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is glycemic index. And I know when I started to learn about sugars, I didn't know exactly what the glycemic index was. I had heard of it, but I didn't know for sure. So the glycemic index is a scale from zero to 100 where it tells us the amount, how a certain food, usually carbohydrates, are gonna affect our blood sugar. So the higher the number on the scale, the closer to 100, the faster that food is metabolized in our system and converted into sugar, which raises our blood sugar and thereby creates more insulin. The lower the number on the scale, the slower it is to metabolize and the slower the sugar response. And we end up getting a nice, slow, gradual increase in blood sugar that also dies down much faster. So the lower the number, the better, the higher the number, not so good. Generally 55 is the cutoff that people will talk about as being, if it's below 55, it's low glycemic. If it's above 55, it's considered a higher glycemic food, okay? So we've gotten rid of sugar, and now we're looking at what are our non-sugar alternatives. And we talked a little about the natural. When sugar started to become the demon and everybody realized that it was not good for us, everybody thought, oh, artificial sweeteners, this is the way to go. No sugar, no calories, it's great. And we were one of those people. So when we first started to take sugar out of our diet, my husband ran to Costco and got the biggest bag of Splenda he could find. <laughs> um, well, research has shown that these artificial sweeteners are actually just like regular sugar in two ways. One, they, uh, they trick our brain because our brain senses all that sweetness and they think, oh, I want more, that whole addiction thing. And the other thing is that it also affects our microbiome and our gut. So just like too much processed foods and too much sugar, it leads to metabolic disease. You end up with insulin resistance, you gain weight, you can even end up getting diabetes from artificial sweeteners. So artificial sweeteners are out. So now we come to our natural sweeteners and I've listed them by glycemic index so that you can kind of get a feel for how they compare to each other. The top of the list is table sugar. And I was actually surprised that table sugar is 63, but table sugar is a combination of glucose at 100 and fructose at 15. So it comes in at 63, which is considered in the high range, 
but uh, not as high as I would have thought, but because of all the refining, we're staying away from that. Next, we have honey and maple syrup. And if you get 100% maple syrup, and if you get raw organic honey, um, they're not at all refined. So they actually have a lot of nutritive value. Um, they have wonderful flavors. And again, they're not at all refined. Same thing with dates, the next one. You can get it in lots of different forms. They all of those three have wonderful flavors, have lots of nutritional value and have uses. I tend to use them when I'm using just like a tablespoon of, of uh, maple syrup or a tablespoon of honey so I can get the flavor, but it's still on the higher end of the low glycemic index. So I try not to use too much of them. With dates, the thing to, to know is that there's also, it's a fruit and most fruits have pectin. Dates have a lot of pectin. So if you're using date sugar, which is just dried, it's very minimally processed, but because of that pectin, it's gonna thicken your product. So if you're baking with it, it's a one-to-one -one substitution for sugar, but it's actually gonna thicken your batter. You're gonna have to decrease your flour by 25%. So it's pretty significant. I like to use whole dates in smoothies. If I'm making a smoothie that maybe doesn't have frozen fruit, so there's nothing to really thicken it up, I can sweeten it with the dates and I get a nice, thickened, delicious smoothie. So from there we go to coconut sugar. And I'm gonna at the same time talk to you about another one called lacuma. There we go. <laughs> so coconut sugar is one of my favorite sweeteners to bake with. It happens to be a, an exact one-to-one -one swap for table sugar. Now, both I'm grouping them together because both of them are brown in color. Both of them have a little bit of a mapley flavor to them. Um, the lacuma is not a one-to-one -one, though. It's actually about half as sweet as sugar. So if you're going to use that, you have to use twice as much. So that makes them really about the same glycemic load wise. Um, but at that point, the coconut sugar is really just easier to come by. And like I said, it's, it's a one-to-one -one swap. So I tend to use coconut sugar more than the lacuma. So next we get down to the really low glycemic sweeteners. We've got agave at 15 and it's at 15 because it is 100% fructose. The problem we've found out with fructose, we first, at first agave was, everybody was running out to get agave, but then we realized that it is 100% fructose and fructose is completely metabolized in your liver and it can't metabolize a whole lot of it. So what happens when you get too much of it in your liver is that it converts it to fat and you end up with the same problems that you had with the artificial sweeteners and everything else. So one option I have is this agave five and it's actually a blend of agave with monk fruit and stevia. So if I'm gonna use agave, that's how I use agave rather than pure agave. Monk fruit, stevia and allulose all zero glycemic index. The monk fruit and stevia, super sweet, like two, 300 times as sweet as sugar. So generally you can either get them in a liquid form, in which, which is great for sauces and salad dressings and things like that, where you're just gonna use a drop or two. If you're using it for baking, what they've done is they've combined it with erythritol. Now erythritol is a sugar alcohol and most sugar alcohols upset people's stomach a lot, so I didn't go into those at all. Erythritol is the one sugar alcohol that doesn't affect people's stomach as much. So they use it to mix it in with monk fruit and stevia for baking, and that is then a one-to-one -one swap for sugar. Again, I wouldn't go overboard with it because it does have that erythritol and it might affect your stomach, but it's a good option. And finally, the last kid on the block, the newest kid is allulose. This is it in its liquid form. It also comes in a powdered form, which again is a one for one for baking. 
I like allulose because it's just about the same level of sweetness as sugar. And like I said, it's a one for one swap and because it's white. So if I'm making something that's light in color, I like to use that because I can't see it. Whereas the coconut sugar with the brown color is great in chocolate, but if I'm using it for something that's light, not as good. So I've just been talking all this time. If you guys have any questions, make sure you type them into the chat and I will answer them now and or going forward. I'm gonna actually get rid of all of my sweeteners now. We're gonna talk about which sweetener is best for each dessert. And I'm gonna get our ingredients for what we're gonna bake. So which sweetener is best for each dessert is the million dollar question. And the truth is, is that there's no one sweetener that's best for any one dessert. What you wanna think about is how can you make each recipe healthier? And you're gonna do that by just, you know, if you wanted to take out dairy of a recipe, you're gonna add, you're gonna substitute vegan butter or coconut uh, yogurt or almond milk. If you were trying to take out gluten, you would substitute a gluten-free flour for your wheat flour. Same thing with the sweeteners. We're gonna take out the sugar and we're gonna substitute with an artificial sweetener. Now, one thing to think about is chocolate. Chocolate's in a lot of dessert recipes. And depending on what chocolate you're using, for example, if you're using chocolate chips that have stevia and erythritol, you might then use, because that's a zero glycemic index, you might then use coconut sugar for the cookie. The recipe we're gonna make today, the chocolate, the chocolate olive oil cake, I generally bake that with coconut sugar in the cake. And then to keep, when I'm making the sauce for the strawberry sauce, to keep my glycemic low down, then I'll use allulose in the strawberry sauce. Or you could use monk fruit or stevia, but one of the other, like a zero glycemic sweetener. In the original picture I showed you, I showed it to you with a caramel sauce. Now that caramel sauce was made with coconut sugar. So then I used an alternate sweetener in the cake. Um, whatever you're doing, as usual, moderation is key and you just wanna try to balance that glycemic load. So up here now I have my website, which is cookcolorful.com and I made a special landing page for you guys from the Nourished Festival. So if you go to cookcolorful.com slash nourished, I have on there the recipe for um, the cake that we're making today. I also have on there the recipe for a chocolate bark that I like to make. And in that chocolate bark, I have, I make my own chocolate and the recipe is in there and how to do it. It's super easy. It's made with, you know, organic cocoa butter and organic cacao and whatever sweetener you want to use, depending on how you're going to use it. So there's a video and a recipe for that. And then there's also information about my upcoming cooking class from cookcolorful.com, I have a cooking club. And if you're at all interested in that, I'm actually, I don't usually do desserts, but this, uh, the members of my cooking club have been asking for a dessert class. So October's class is actually a whole class on healthy desserts. And I'm gonna be doing an apple pomegranate crisp. I'm gonna be doing a chocolate mousse with coconut cream. And then the third recipe that I'm going to make is a member's choice. Members of the cooking club are going to choose what that's going to be. So we'll have to see what that's going to be. <laughs> um, so we are going to get started making the cake now. And you don't have the recipe yet, so I'm going to have it scrolling across the top as I'm baking. So don't have to worry about writing things down. It will be available to you on cookcolorful.com slash nourished. And it's also gonna be scrolling across the top. So the first thing that we're gonna do, I'm gonna grab my mixing bowl. The first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna take a quick look at what's going into it. The first thing is cocoa powder. And to this cocoa powder, 
we're going to add a little bit of boiling water and we're going to make a paste. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. We're going to add to that some vanilla and then we're going to set that aside and we're going to add the rest of our ingredients. We're going to mix it up and then you'll see how it comes out in the end. So the cocoa powder that I'm using is this right here, if you can see that. And it's actually cacao powder rather than cocoa powder. And the difference is that cacao powder, kind of like the sugar, we want it to be as least refined as possible. Cocoa powder ha is also refined. Cacao is not heat processed. So it keeps all of the great nutrients that you hear about that are in chocolate. The cacao powder has all those nutrients, whereas cocoa powder won't have the nutrients. So I sifted that, which just meant I put it through a little sieve so that there's no lumps. And I've done it without sifting it. It still works, but it just mixes in a little bit easier if you do. To that, you want to add about a half a cup. But I will tell you that I don't usually use the whole half a cup. What we're going for is a paste that can that's a little bit runny, but it's pretty thick. It's not going to run a lot. And I'm going to show you exactly what you're looking for so you can see that. I'm going to grab my hot water here. And you can see I'm just pouring. I'm not measuring. But I've also done this many times before. So I'm going to start with maybe about a quarter of a cup, and I'll have to add more. And I hear that there's some good questions. Give me one second and I'm gonna start answering all those questions. The first one is, is Truvia gonna use? Truvia is a stevia blend. Um, and that's fine, but again, it's gonna be mixed with erythritol. So just be cautious in how much you use of it. All right, so if you can see this is thick, just barely moving. I might actually add just a tiny bit more water in there. Because it's really just barely moving. And I also made a mess, so let me grab a paper towel. <laughs> I'm going to put just a drop more. And I mean just a drop, because it's pretty much there. And if I didn't add a drop, it would still be fine. It's a pretty forgiving recipe. So don't worry about getting it exact. All right. So it's nice and smooth, moving just a little. Now I'm going to add two teaspoons of vanilla extract. And this vanilla extract that I'm using is actually vanilla extract that I made myself. You don't need to make your own vanilla extract. I'm a little over the top sometimes. But it's really good. Lisa asks, do monk fruit and the others have the same strong taste that stevia does? So that's a great question. And stevia is known to have a bitterness to it. And what I have learned is that the bitterness actually comes from not from the stevia itself, but it's the way we perceive it. Because it is so sweet, it's literally 300 times as sweet as sugar, our taste buds don't know what to do with that. So our taste buds detect it as bitter. Now, the other ones, if you, stevia and monk fruit are both super sweet. So if you use too much of it, you might get that bitter taste. Um, if you use it in the powdered form combined with the erythritol, I don't think that you'll have that experience. And if you do have the experience of bitterness, just try going a little bit less on the amount. Amanda says, I'm not a fan of the taste of stevia. Does allulose have a strange flavor similar to stevia? It really doesn't. That's why I like allulose. Allulose has no flavor. So I'm gonna set the chocolate aside now that we mixed in 
the vanilla. And we're going to let that just kind of cool for a little while. And in the meantime, we are going to crack our three eggs, which I stuck back into the fridge. They do not need to be room temperature, by the way. And I'm cracking them into a bowl just in case I accidentally get any shell. Makes it easier to get it out. Here's another one that Anita asked. An yep. Anita asks, what's a good gluten-free, dairy-free yogurt that is low in sugar? Many coconut and almond mild ones Mild ones are still up to 17 grams of sugar. So when you're looking at yogurts, your best bet is to go with a plain yogurt, whether it's coconut or almond or even a milk-based yogurt if you can tolerate milk. Um, if you go with a plain yogurt, then you get to decide what you're putting into it, whether it's fruit or how much, you know, what type of sweetener it is. If you're gonna, if you're buying a fruit yogurt, it's going to have a lot of sugar in it. That's just the way they do it. I'm not aware of one that's sweetened with healthier sweeteners, more natural sweeteners. So I always go with just a plain and then I can make it the way I like it. But that's a great question. Okay. So in our larger bowl, slightly larger, we're not going to the mixing bowl quite yet. We're just going to get our dry ingredients together. And I have um, one and a half cups of almond flour. If you're measuring, it's about five ounces. So I'm going to dump that into my bowl. To that, I am going to add one half teaspoon of baking soda and just a pinch of salt. And I have that already measured out in there. So that's going to go in there as well. Um, we're going to set this aside. So now we're going to grab our mixing bowl and we are going to add one cup of coconut sugar is what I have here. And that is what I usually make this with. Again, it works great with anything that you're making with chocolate, especially. And we're going to add our eggs, our three eggs. And to this, we're going to also add two thirds cup of olive oil. That's our fat. We're not going to have a dairy in this. And you might be thinking olive oil is such a strong flavor, but it's actually the fruity flavor of the olives with the chocolate is so good. You can also do a really beautiful citrus cake with olive oil and phenomenal. All right. So I'm going to go back here for a second and get it started mixing. And then I'm going to come back and ask some questions. This has to mix for about three minutes until the eggs and the sugar and the oil combine and get nice and light in color. Hopefully you can hear me over that. I'll try to speak a little louder. But we've got lots of questions, and I'm going to take this opportunity to answer some questions before we move on. Is there an egg substitute that works well in this recipe? So this recipe has three eggs. I'm a little hesitant to say a flax egg when there's three eggs. If there's one or two eggs in a recipe, flax eggs work great. The other thing that you can use is aquafaba. I don't know if you've ever tried that. It's actually the liquid from um, when you get a can of chickpeas and you can buy it in a dried form and it works really well as an egg substitute. They also make some egg substitutes. I actually really like the aquafaba. I think it works very, very well. Other questions? How much boiling water? So the recipe calls for a half a cup. You're not going to use a whole half a cup. You're going to pour it in just until you get 
a thick paste that still moves around a little bit in your bowl. You don't want it to be so thick that it doesn't move, but you also don't want it to be runny. And I know that's not an exact amount, but you'll, you'll get a feel for it. It's not, if you go a little bit more or a little less, it's not gonna make a big difference in this recipe. If you're allergic to almonds, can you sub a gluten-free flour? So I've never done that with this recipe. You can certainly do it, but you might have to play with the amounts of liquids. Um, almond flour is usually moister than most of the gluten-free flours. So you might have to add another egg. Um, when substituting stevia for sugar in baked goods, is it a one-to-one -one conversion or less? Stevia, remember, is super, super sweet. So if you're using a stevia that's made for baking, that's combined with erythritol, it'll say on there a one-to-one -one conversion, and that you can use one-to-one -one for baking. If you're using stevia liquid, it's literally a teaspoon of stevia equals one cup of sugar. So that's a big, big difference. Great question, though. Um, Can you scroll up? Along with sugar and dairy, I must be egg free. We got, we talked about egg substitutes. Um, cacao comes from the trees and cocoa comes from the factory. <laughs> okay, well that's a good way to describe it. Basically cacao is in the natural form. It hasn't been processed and it keeps all of those nutrients in it, just like we talked about in the beginning. Um, all right. That's good, and it's been just about three minutes here. I'm gonna turn that down, and I'm gonna bring this over so you can see. And you can see it's no longer super thin. It's now, there we go. It's now kind of like a thickened cream texture. All right? It's not thick, but it's not a liquid either. So now to this, I'm going to just grab a spatula. To this, we're going to, um, well, actually, normally I do this in the, in, the, in the mixer as I think about it, but we'll just do this here. It's fine. Now we're going to add our chocolate. And give that a good stir. Till that's completely combined. And then we're gonna add our dry ingredients, our flour, baking soda, and salt. And we're gonna do that kind of gradually so that we can get that all mixed in and we don't get too many clumps. I'm going to kind of work some of those clumps out as we go. I'm going to add the last bit. And I'm going to stir that all in. And for this, we're going to preheat our oven to 325 degrees. I should have mentioned that earlier. So you don't want to over mix it at this point, but you just want to make sure that there's no major lumps in there. And we are going to then place that into a pan. This is a nine inch spring form pan that I have lined with parchment paper. So first I sprayed it with a uh, spray oil, like an avocado oil spray, and then I put the parchment paper in, okay? So now I'm just going to pour my ingredients into the pan. Who 
Laura says beautiful kitchen. <laughs> Thank you, Laura, for saying I have a beautiful kitchen. This was actually because my son needed to be completely gluten-free. It's not entirely because. We were talking about redoing our kitchen anyhow. And then we decided, well, here's our rationale for redecorating our kitchen. All right, so I'm just gonna smooth that out. And that is good to go. Does this cake freeze and defrost well, Anita asks. So this cake actually freezes wonderfully and defrosts. Um, I usually wrap it in plastic wrap and then I wrap it in foil just to make sure that it's sealed from the freezer and it's not gonna get any funny flavors. But go ahead and freeze it and then just take it out a couple hours before you wanna serve it. It's perfect. All right, so we now have it in our pan and I'm going to stick it into the oven. And actually I did not preheat my oven, so I'm gonna wait for a couple minutes before I actually stick it in. In the meantime, while that's baking, we are going to work on our strawberry sauce. I don't need this anymore. But I do need a cooktop. So for the strawberry sauce, let me grab the strawberries. I am using a bag of frozen strawberries. These ones are from Trader Joe's. It's a 12 ounce bag. If it's a 16 ounce bag, you'll just want to use a little bit more sweetener. Um, I happen to have a Trader Joe's across the street. So I'm really lucky. And I grabbed this. This is a 12 ounce bag. So to this, I usually add about a quarter of a cup of allulose when I'm sweetening it with allulose. And if I were going with a 16 ounce bag, or if I were using like a pound of fresh strawberries, I would probably end up using closer to a third of a pound. So all I'm doing is pouring the frozen strawberries that have been thawed into the pan. I'm going to turn that on now, and we're going to put it. There we go. Um, put it on medium. It doesn't have to be super hot. Now to that, we are going to add about two teaspoon or about one teaspoon of lemon juice. And like I said, about a quarter cup of allulose. All right. So let me grab the allulose since I took it away. And I have this nice handy dandy little measuring cup, which shows me exactly four tablespoons or a quarter of a cup. So I'm gonna add that. And then I'm going to very carefully, since I don't have a cutting board here, cut through the half a lemon without getting the counter. And I'm going to squeeze just a teaspoon and I can measure it in here and throw that in as well. So this is an induction cooktop. It's gonna start simmering very quickly, which it already is. We're just gonna let that simmer for about 10 minutes. And the reason why why we're cooking it and letting it simmer is, remember we talked about the pectins that are in the dates? Well, we're trying to pull the pectins out of the strawberries by simmering it. And it's gonna take about 10 to 20 minutes because there's not nearly as many pectins in strawberries as there are in dates. Um, so we can just simmer those. And then we can put them into the blender and make our sauce. Are there any more questions while this simmers? 
Can we use cocoa instead of cacao? You absolutely can. It's an exact, you know, you're gonna use the exact same amount. You're just not getting as much of the nutritive value. Um, another defrost. All right, I think we're good. All right, so, so you guys don't have to sit and watch me do this. I'm gonna go ahead, I'm not gonna give it the full 10 minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and blend it so you can see how we do it. All right, so I'm gonna take my blender. I'm gonna turn this off and we're just gonna pour this into the blender. And it's gonna taste the same, it's just maybe not gonna be quite as thick. And I have one that I made the other day, so you'll get to see that. So I'm gonna bring it over here. Okay, you want to make sure you puree it so there's no pieces of fruit in there. And you can see, I think, maybe you can't really appreciate it in here. It's pretty thin because we didn't cook it for very long. As opposed to this one that I made the other day is much, much thicker. It's like a, a thick sauce now. And this is what we'll use to plate the cake. <laughs> um, this is just too runny, otherwise it'll go all over the plate. But if you cook it like you're supposed to, you're gonna get that nice thick sauce. All right, so I have a cake that I made this morning also. I'm going to just put a little bit of powdered sugar on it and then I'm gonna plate it and show you how beautiful it looks with We can get rid of all of this. That's what it looks like all done. And I'm gonna go ahead and cut a slice and plate it with some of the strawberry sauce so you can see. It's also really nice with mint. If you have a mint leaf to garnish or some berries, like in that original one of the pictures I showed you. Take a nice piece of that. It's super moist. And then you can take your strawberry sauce and make dots. You could do a swish, do different size dots. I have this fun little plate here. So just trying to make it pretty. So a couple of questions. One was how long do you get the cake? Great question, I didn't say that. Um, it's in the recipe. The question was, how long do I bake the cake for? And the cake bakes for about 35 minutes. And I say about because every oven is different, but you want to bake it until the sides are completely set. The top, the center and the top should be mostly set. It'll look still a little bit moist you'll pull it out and it'll continue to, uh, it'll continue to set as it sits. Um, and what's gonna happen is it's gonna actually kind of pull away from the pan as it cools. So then you open up the spring form pan and it pops right out. So it's super easy to plate. Any other questions? Kathy asks, what is allulose? So, Great question, and I didn't go into a lot of detail about allulose, but allulose is considered a rare sugar. It's made from raisins, figs, kiwi, and jackfruit. Um, and it's that's the one that I said has the least amount of research because it's the newest natural alternative sweetener that's out there. 
but the research that is coming out says that it's actually healthy for your microbiome, healthy for your gut, um, and doing and very healthy for you. They haven't seen any negative side effects to it. Um, it's a very clean white sweetener. It's a great substitute. Deborah asks, what did you use um, for your powdered sugar? So I ran out of powdered sugar. So I actually made this, which is just I blended um, organic table sugar. And I did use table sugar for that because I'm using so little. But if you want to you if you want to cut down on that also, remember the monk fruit, um, the Lakanto makes a powdered sugar version and you can use that and that works wonderfully and it's zero glycemic index. Um, Trisha says, I'm on your website and can't locate this recipe. Is it posted? Go to cookcolorful.com slash nourished and it should be there. When we're done here, I'll go and double check, but I'm quite certain it's there. You just have to click on the picture. Let me grab a fork and I'm going to take a bite because it's so good. Mm. It's so soft and moist, it actually like melts in your mouth. Your family will not believe that this is gluten-free, dairy-free, and refined sugar-free. It is so good, full of chocolate flavor. I promise they're going to love this. Um, Trisha said you used liquid allulose in the recipe. Would you use the same amount of allulose from sugar? I'm not sure I'm understanding the question. Um, allulose is an exact swap in the amounts for sugar. And if you're asking liquid versus powdered, same thing. You're going to use a quarter. I used a quarter of a cup. I would use a quarter of a cup of um, the powdered also. Hopefully that answers your question. Richard just said, yes, found it on the website. So that's good. Hopefully, Trisha, you can find that. Um, Connie, what is the amount change using allulose from sugar? I think I just answered that, hopefully. It's the same. The oven temperature is 325. Um, what about 350 or 375? I think you're just asking what was the temperature and 325 for about 35 minutes. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, any other questions? I think we're good. All right, so there is the site again. It's cookcolorful.com slash nourished. And that takes you to the landing page that I made, especially for the uh, Nourished Festival. And that has the cake recipe along with the strawberry sauce. For the caramel sauce recipe, you actually have to go into my recipes data bank. That's not on that page, but that's on my website. And you can also find out about both my upcoming cooking class in October, as well as my cooking club. With the cooking club, you get all of you get the entire year of cooking classes. And if you miss a class, because I do the class just once in the month, if you miss the class, I have a Facebook, a private Facebook group that I post all of those videos in. So you can watch, you can go back and watch it anytime you want. Um, also on that Facebook Live, we have an, a really nice community where people can ask questions of me or each other. And I'm active on there, so I'm always there to answer your questions. We also, once a month, the beginning of the month, we play a little game called Ingredient Roulette, where the members of the club pick an ingredient that they're not so comfortable with, they don't know how to use it, and I do a video and a recipe based on that ingredient. Last month, it was spaghetti squash, and I don't know what October will be. Um, and, oh, I also give extra content to the club members every month. So last month we did a, a, a basil pesto uh, cooking class and we did all different kinds of recipes using basil pesto. We did a 
cucumber basil gazpacho and we did a salmon with basil and we did a pasta with um, roasted tomatoes and artichoke hearts and, and pesto, which was delicious. But for my club members, I then added to that three other different types of pesto that they could use. And the additional content for the upcoming cooking for the baking class is going to be a gluten-free, dairy-free, refined sugar-free molten chocolate cake, which is amazing. I came up with that for a private class that I did and it was so good. Richard says, thanks so much. You are fantastic. Hope to see you again. Thank you, Richard. I hope to see you again. And I hope to see all of you again, either at one of my classes or in my cooking club. And what's your Facebook page again? My Facebook page, we'll put it up one more time. My Facebook page is at Cook Colorful. Same thing with Instagram, at Cook Colorful. My uh, website is cookcolorful.com. And the special landing page for the festival is cookcolorful.com slash nourished. Thanks so much, everybody. Hope you had fun. Take care. Bye.